I am so excited today to have with us Katie Carter. Katie is a lawyer that I have known for quite a while. Um, she's in Virginia, I'm in Maryland, but we were in a mastermind together uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I've always enjoyed talking to her and listening to her about the work that she does. She is in a family law practice in Virginia Beach. And I'm just really excited to have her here today so we can talk about what's working with family law in terms of marketing and business and get some tips from her. So Katie, welcome. It's Thank great you. to see you. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and excited to be featured in such a, such a cool thing that you're doing, Bold oh. Women Lawyers. I, I love it. Thank you. Well, let's jump in. Okay. Yeah, let's so uh, as I mentioned, you are uh, in a family law practice. So I'm going to ask you just to tell our audience about how you ended up choosing family law as a practice or how it chose you. And tell us a little bit about the law firm. Well, I think it, um, it, it was pretty personal for me. I ended up choosing family law. Well, or I, think, I think you said it more accurately. It, it chose me because of there was a, a marriage in my family, um, a family member kind of close to us who married, I think I would say the wrong person. My mom always said, you know, you have to be really careful who you marry, the person you bring home, they influence the family in so many ways. And I really saw that acted out in the destruction that, that this brought to not just, not my immediate family, my extended family, but then, it, and then in law school, it happened again, except this time I found myself in an abusive relationship. And yeah, I mean, I was lucky. I can't complain compared to um, some of the experiences that a lot of my clients have had. But um, I remember having just these nightmares that I was going to marry this guy and end up on this path that I just, that I couldn't get off. So I was, I was fortunately able to extricate myself, but I did my clinical law work while I was in law school in the family law clinic and worked with a number of domestic violence survivors. Um, it, it, and it just really cemented my desire to, to do this work. There's a lot of different kinds of law out there, but there's very few things that are as intensely personal and important as, as divorce and custody law. And so that's kind of sort of what, why I, I found myself here. I do believe, you know, not to be too like naive or cliche, but um, it's a calling and it's something that I believe deeply in. And I found myself um, in this firm, which I think is even even more important because I, I'm with Hoffheimer Family Law. We are in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and we actually represent women exclusively um, in divorce custody and support cases. So I think that's, that's a, it's a big differentiator. There's very few firms nationwide who are representing women exclusively. We're the only one in Virginia. And I think last I, last I checked, we're the largest. We have six attorneys, but it's, um, it's just, it's a, it's such a great place to be. And it's such an important mission. It's a valuable work, I think. Well, I love that. And uh, I, I think one of the things that struck me right from the very beginning when I met you and your founder, Charlie Hofheimer, was the fact that this was many, many years ago, even before you joined the firm, as I understand it, that Charlie had made the decision that you would represent women only. So you were niching as a a law practice long before that became a popular yes. idea. Tell us a little bit, because I think this is a great story, of how you ended up at Hoffheimer Law. Oh, I was just, I was so lucky. <laughs> I was, you know, just a, law, a little baby law student um, looking for a job. And I found Charlie's email. I would, saw the work that he was doing. I was already a, at that point really interested in family law. So I just reached out to him. He told me in no uncertain terms that he had no work for me and no spaces at the office. But um, he said that he was going to treat this like American Idol for lawyers. I'm still not sure why. He said I'd get one bite at the apple and I just had to write him 
a half a page about why if he didn't hire me, it would be the biggest mistake of his life. And I did. He actually got mad because I wrote a little bit more than half a page. And he said I needed to learn to follow instructions better. <laughs> but he, he hired me. <laughs> and um, I've, I've been at the firm for a little over a little over 10 years now. Charlie's retired. But he and his daughter, Kristen, who um, has since passed away, um, just I cannot tell you how you know formative they've been in my experience they really just kind of created this role for me in the in the firm and 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 raised me up to where I am and I just I couldn't I could never thank them enough for the influence they've had on my life and my career and for bringing me to this point well that's wonderful and that you know there's a couple of lessons in what you just said so the first is you emailed Charlie to say mm -hmm. I like your firm, I like yeah. your work. Gee, I'd love to work for you, even though you had no idea if there were any openings, right? Yeah, I ne yeah, never met him, didn't really you know, know anything more than what I saw on the website and what they were doing. They had the free book for women going through divorce, which I devoured. Like I was so excited to see that. And like, this is amazing. I uh, saw the depth and breadth of the content on the site and just felt like, you know, it was, it was different from anything I had seen anywhere else, what I had seen other lawyers doing. And I just knew I, I wanted to be a part of it. Well, let's talk a little bit then about um, what you just said. You know, they, they already had a book uh, mm -hmm. about women and divorce. And I know you've added to that since you've been with the firm. So mm -hmm. that's something that um, I think a lot of lawyers don't realize about uh, marketing uh, to their their clients or their prospective clients, that education is so important. So can you talk yes. a little bit about the importance of uh, the materials that you make available for free, right? Yeah, it's all it's yeah. all free. We have we have four titles now, and they've all they've all gone through a, you know a series of of revisions. Most of which I've had it at this point. I'm kind of copywriter in chief at the firm too, <laughs> um, which is great because I love writing. But I I think that the thing that we've done really well historically, and that that we continue to really prioritize, is is education because. For so many people, I mean, I think this is true across disciplines of law, but it's just, you know, it's especially relevant to us in family law, is that these women are coming to us and they're not sure which way to go. And they've heard horror stories and their friends have been divorced and it's gone badly. And, you know, they just come with with so much baggage and so much fear that if you can, if you can capture them in the early days, if you can talk to them about the process and what's involved and alternatives to litigation, you can really help shape their decision making. So that both so they don't make any big mistakes, but also so that you know, the, the decisions that they make are carefully calculated. So they get to the outcome that they want. And, and for me, that's, that's the goal. It's not just to have some nasty divorce played out in court that leaves everybody, you know, feeling victimized, but to help them help coach them find a solution that's going to work for them and work for their families and help to, you know, prioritize the things that are the most important to that particular person. It's, it's not a one size fits all. It should be a tailored experience that's designed to help them reach this, you know, the, this potential so that the, on the day that their final divorce decree is, is signed, they have what they need for their, their new happily ever after. I'm not saying that the whole process is a fairy tale. It's not, but at the end, it's an opportunity to, to make, to make different choices, to make your life what you want it to be. And I want to feel like I've given my clients the information that they needed throughout the process to make the best possible decisions. And that's, I think that comes from, that comes from education, that comes from education early in the process before they make emotional decisions or um, decisions based out of fear that ultimately end up hurting their case and making it take longer and cost more money. That's, that's the main thing I want to avoid is, is just making sure that they are, are centered at the beginning of the process and sure of the goals so that they can execute it. And, and, what you referred to, again, is also so important because you're talking about your client journey and it's it's different for every client. They come in yes. with their own issues and stories, but but the client journey is so important. And, and I, I love the fact that you're emphasizing, look, 
we don't have to make this a nasty at every step of the way kind mm -hmm. of experience. It's not going to be easy, but there's things that we can do to sort of to maximize the benefit to you and yeah. to make the process flow as smoothly as it can under the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not perfect, but right. to the extent that you have the best information available, you can make the best decisions possible, not just for yourself, but for any kids you share in common and, and, you know, the extended family and all the other people who are, who are touched by your marriage. So I think there's, there's just a, there's a lot of opportunities to make both good and bad choices. And it has a tremendous impact on the success of the case at the end of it. And I want my clients at the end to feel like, okay, I mean, maybe it wasn't a whole lot of fun, but it put me in the position that I need to be in, you know, for, for the future that I'm envisioning for myself. Exactly. Exactly. Now you talked about the books and the other thing that, that always struck me as so progressive and forward thinking for your firm was when I first met you all, you were doing what you called second Saturday. Mm -hmm. So can you explain to everybody what that is and, yeah. and how it works? Second Saturday is our, our monthly divorce seminar. And it's, we call it that because we do it on the second Saturday of the month. We also have one on the third Tuesday of the month, but we used to do them in person and now we're doing them hundred percent virtually. So they're done on zoom. And it's just a really cool way to help give women um, an introduction to the divorce process in Virginia. Um, it's an hour and a half seminar where we talk about the, the basics, how, you know, how a case progresses, different alternatives to litigation, what um, attorney's fees might look like, you know, just explaining how custody is handled, spousal support, um, equitable distribution. So basically how the property is divided, just to give them an idea of what their rights and entitlements are under the law in Virginia. And it's also, it's, it's interactive. We use a question and answer format on Zoom. So they can ask questions directly to us through the seminar and we can answer those questions orally. Um, and it's, it's just a really it's a really great way for people to begin to gather that information. Uh, we've got the book and the book goes into, you know, it's, it's a little bit more detailed, usually depending on exactly what the questions are in the seminar. So much, of course, have, depends on the exact questions that we get, but not everybody learns best from a book. So it's, it's, it's nice to be able to come to the seminar to ask the specific question that's keeping you up at night, not just you know, see what's in the pages of that book. I think it should, it would probably lead you to more and more and more questions. And you can bring those questions. You can ask those questions. It's um, always one of the six of us. We're all licensed attorneys, you know, teaching the seminar um, and answering the questions so that you can be sure that the information that you're getting is up to date. It's Virginia specific and it comes directly from a lawyer who has experience practicing in the local courts. So it's kind of it's kind of unique, but it's a it's a great way to get get they have those basic questions answered. Oh, absolutely! And and as you and I had discussed, you're now all virtual doing yes. that, um, and you had been in person before. So tell us how the you're all virtual because of COVID, of course. Right. But tell right. us how that actually affected the success of Second Saturdays. It's, it's so much better. <laughs> uh, we have been doing um, the seminars live since the, since the early 90s, um, obviously not me personally, but um, for, so for a long time and our attendance was sort of in a, in a decline for a while. I think um, kind of like talking about divorce on social media, having this, you know, in-person um, component is challenging for a lot of people. We were, we had a couple meeting spaces where we would have these seminars and I think going in person and, you know, asking questions face to face, being afraid you'd run into someone, you know, um, was a bit of a detractor. So when COVID hit and we made the transition to virtual, which we were thinking was only going to be temporary at the time, we wanted to go back to in-person. Um, it looks like we're going to keep it virtual. The attendance has really spiked. We're able to protect um, conf the confidentiality of the attendees a lot better that way. I can, I, as a as a presenter, I can see the list of the people in my seminar, but they can't see each other. They can't see faces. I don't see their faces. They just 
see me in my presentation. So, and it, it's, it's, it's really confidential. They can ask questions, but nobody can see who's asking questions. I just answer them orally in the, in the middle of the seminar. So they get the answers to those questions, but we can, we can totally, totally protect them. And that's something that is, is unique and they don't have to come face to face. And I think even talking to a lawyer is kind of scary for a lot of people and having that computer screen buffer makes us hopefully makes us a little bit less a little bit less scary. I mean, I do try to not be intimidating in general, um, but it's 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 a hard thing. It's a personal thing, and um, we've found that having it virtual really has helped. We were worried at first about still maintaining that connection because getting in front of people and building a rapport and answering those questions live is sometimes a really emotional and cathartic experience. You know, they sort of become your best friend. They're following you out to the car on the way out after the seminar. Um, but uh, so far it has, you know, the, the ROI has still been really good. We're still getting consults from these people. Um, and now of course we have more people attending. So more consults, but it was really encouraging to us to see that we could still have that relationship develop between us and these people, but not necessarily be physically in front of them. I think that's great. Yeah. And, and I think for so many people now, because of the pandemic, Zoom has become a way of life. They're very yeah. comfortable with it. And I can particularly see for family law and divorce issues, you don't want to run the risk of, oh, I'm going to show up, but what if my husband's cousin is there because yeah. she's like not happy in her marriage or my next door or somebody, yeah. like you said, somebody who knows me and now I'm really uncomfortable. Yeah. So what a bonus. What a bonus. Yeah. 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 Definitely protect in the early stages. Um, keeping that information close to your chest is really important to a lot of women. Uh, so it's, we, we try to help that in as, as many ways as possible by encouraging them to get their own spouse safe email address, you know, communicating that way. And, and, and now the virtual seminars, it just, it allows us to make sure that, you know, we can give women the information that they need and they don't have, it's not going to get found out until they're ready to start talking about it. Oh, that's great. That is yeah. great. Yeah. That is great. And uh, so, so that's how, uh, the pandemic has affected certainly a big part of your marketing. Has, yeah. How has the pandemic, if it has, affected the actual running of the business? Uh, we're a lot more virtual. I'm almost 100% virtual at this point, um, but I think it has really injected a lot more flexibility um, to our day-to-day. -day. We do in-person meetings now, um, but a lot of people are still choosing to do phone and Zoom appointments. We're still doing um, some WebEx hearings and things like that instead of in-person hearings. Um, I think the biggest change is that the courts are so backed up that getting a trial date is really hard, but that has kind of changed, not, I mean, not totally changed our practice because there are some things some cases where there's nothing to do but put it on on for a trial but we've seen a lot more um, settlement conferences and a lot more people opting for collaborative divorce and things like that as an alternative to traditional litigation so that they can get it done before they could actually get a trial date so um, I mean business is business is good there's been a lot of a lot of divorces our volume is great um, but we are <laughs> but we are still um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that you know, side effect of the pandemic, <laughs> we've spent entirely too much time together. Um, but it, it, it's, it's true. working really well. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know you had mentioned uh, that, that you're almost 100% um, uh, remote. Yeah. And it's interesting, though, that the clients are not rushing to come back in person either. No, uh, and I can some. tell you, yeah, some, some, yeah. yeah. I can tell you that in my own, you know, my practice was all disability and long before the pandemic, a decade at least or more, yeah, we were doing almost all of our client meetings over the phone and people, it's surprising how comfortable they will be with that. That was by their choice, but particularly yeah. now that people are, I mean, some people are sick and tired of Zoom and they don't want to do another Zoom call, but yeah. But people are used to it, they understand it, they know it's effective, and gee, 
I don't have to drive 20 minutes yes. to the lawyer's office. I can just sit in a in my office on my lunch break in my car correct. or yeah. Correct. Yeah, so much correct. more flexibility. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there's there's positives certainly that have come out of the pandemic. No question of that. Yeah, lots of lots of positives. I lots think. of positives. Yes. So um we've talked, I think you said you have four books now. The firm has four, four yeah. on different aspects of yeah. A divorce Family one, divorce. a custody one, a military divorce one, and one about choosing a lawyer. Ah, okay. And you're in a big military area, right, down in Virginia? We are, South. yeah, have oh. heavily military. So mm-hmm. we get a lot of military divorces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so let me just talk to you just for a few minutes about the idea of the books, because I know, you know, that was one of the major things that I did too. But yeah. I can remember initially thinking, a book? No, you know, it's like, I have to have citations and I have to put it in appellate brief form and it's going to take forever. Oh, you don't have to do all that. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so so talk, just, just talk about, you know, your uh, experience with it and the process of putting a book together. Well, I love to write. So, um, you know, there's, I think on a fundamental level, there are going to be people who love it and people who don't, but in general, I think you have to not, you have to trust yourself. You have to recognize that you are, you know, at expert level compared to a lot of these people. So you know the questions that they're asking, you know the answers to these questions. And a lot of them are not rocket science. And we're not talking about an in-depth treatise about taking a case from start to finish. We're talking about answering the questions that they have at the beginning of the process, giving them enough information so that they can see what options are available to them and then help them to choose an option, ideally an option that includes you, um, but an option that you know helps them to prioritize their specific goals. And I think if you remember that you're really just focusing on this, this beginning part of the process, these introductory questions that so many people are having, you're not having this you know, in-depth conversation about something that happens way, way, way on down the line. You're talking about the very beginning of the process. You're talking about first steps and you're talking about it in a way that using their, ideally using their words in a way that they can understand uh, plain, plain English, you know, so that you can take some of the mystery out of it and help them to, to co- coach them to, to the right decision. So it's, it's a smaller task than I think people think when they think, oh, I've got to write a book about, you know, divorce or disability law or personal injury law. It's just, what do I do at the beginning? What are these big questions? What are these big no-nos? What are the, you know, goals and objectives I should be thinking about at this point? And how do I make sure that I protect myself? So it's a, it's a smaller task than just, you know, write this, this whole treatise. That's not what you're doing. It, exactly. And the, and the other thing it does for the people that are, are reading it is it makes you the expert. You're the obvious expert because mm-hmm. you've now answered all of their very, what to us as lawyers yeah. are very basic questions, but to them as non-lawyers yeah. are huge and information that they really need. So now here you already are as the expert. And um, as you and I know, your book has all of your contact information in yeah. lots of places so that if they're not ready, as soon as they've read it, when they are ready, you're the yeah, obvious choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're the yeah. obvious choice. Yeah. 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 Ethically in Virginia, I don't know the rules in Maryland, but we're not allowed to actually say that we're experts um, in, in our marketing. So uh, it's kind of a way of being like, well, I mean, I'm, I can't say I'm an expert, but I did write the book. So, you know, extrapolate from that what you may. <laughs> exactly. And to a lay person, you know, yeah. that the ethical rules are what they are for lawyers. Yeah. But to a lay person, the expert is the person who wrote the book. the book. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. And ideally the person who's speaking to them on a real level, I think it's a great opportunity to display your empathy and to talk about, you know, how, how they might be feeling and, 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 and what the situation is like, because this isn't just, this isn't a textbook. This is, yeah. you know, a convert is part of a, 
at the beginning of a conversation and building a relationship. And ultimately people hire other people to work with that they like. It's not so much that they're looking at where you went to law school or you know what boards you're on or whether you were editor of your law review. They're trying to have an authentic conversation about something that's extremely personal to them with someone that they feel like understands them that isn't judging them that can you know that, that can that can work with them I mean in family law we have to talk about some really sensitive topics people's sex lives comes up come up people's finances you know relationships with extended family members it's deeply personal so to have those kinds of conversations you need to be a person who's not going to judge and a person that they can trust and to convey that is is I think one of the most one of the most important things that that you can do because there are hard conversations to have especially not so much for us. We're just sitting there trying to help solve the situation, but to this vulnerable person sitting across from you in your chair, talking about, you know, something that um, is embarrassing or personal or, you know, just uncomfortable to admit, um, you know, you have, to, you have to be empathetic. You have to be approachable and kind. And, and the book is the first place to show that. That's a great point. That is a great point because you're right. If for lawyers, it's what we do. It's yeah. the law, it's the lawsuit, it's how we handle a case. But for the client, yeah, it's personal. Yeah. It's for divorce, hopefully it's their one and only time they have to go through it. But yeah, yeah. all of a sudden you're having to answer highly personal questions yes. and that is uncomfortable and you have to feel some level of rapport with yeah. the person that's gonna represent you. So I, that's yeah. an excellent, excellent point, yeah. So, you know, our audience, the lawyers that are listening um, yeah. are, are women and, and some guys, but mainly women who are in solo practice or small firms, or maybe thinking about going into solo or small firm practice. So I'm going to ask you if you had one piece of advice to give to a woman lawyer who is in her own practice or her own small firm, what would that be? I think it would be mostly to try and establish a work-life balance that that works for you, especially, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's especially in family law, but I feel like I really struggle with taking the work home with me, with, you know, wearing, with really wearing my clients' struggles and feel, feeling my concern for them and their futures and their children um, and all of the things that are, that are connected. And I'm fortunate enough to work for, at a firm where our work-life balance is, is really important. We are not expected to work on weekends. We're not expected to work after 5 p.m. We sort of get shamed a little bit for doing it. Um, so I've been fortunate. I sort of fell into this with Charlie, um, but not, not all of my friends from law school were so lucky. They went to firms where the billable hours were just astronomical, where their mental health really, you know, really took a decline. And, and I would say that you can't lose sight of the fact that you have to take care of yourself. You have to protect yourself. You have to establish a balance that, that works for you. You have to be there to raise your children when they're little. Yeah. I have two, I have two little ones and um, I don't, I don't, I don't want my job to make me miss it. I want, I love my job. I believe in my job. I, I would never, I would never, I can't imagine my life without my job, but I also am more than my job. And I have, I have a family, I have children. I have things that are important to me outside of work. So I would say, just try and establish those boundaries in whatever way works for you. I, for example, refuse to have my work email on my phone because I'll check it at 2 a.m. And that is a distraction for, I can't have it. So set up the boundaries in a way that's, that's healthy for you. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help from, you know, an older colleague or a therapist or a doctor um, if you need it, and then do your best to leave work at work. And you know, that's, that's great advice. I love, I love the point about email and not having yeah. it on your phone, your work email. And, yeah. and the reality too is, you can't represent your clients at the highest level yes. if you yourself are not healthy. Yes. I mean, it's just a fact. So that's great. That's great advice. Great yeah. tips, Katie. Okay. Here's my last sure. question. Okay. So, I'm ready. What's the worst piece of business advice you ever got? I, I was thinking about this one. And okay, so when I first started practicing, I was given this absolute dog of a custody case. 
and I was told you can't win it. <laughs> it's gonna suck. <sighs> but they said shit rolls downhill. <sighs> and at the time I was like, they're right. I'm shit. You know, <laughs> this is, you know, this is just how it is. Um, but the older I am, the more I, the more I reflect back on that. I did win that case, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah but the more I think about that, the more I feel like that is unfair. <laughs> I think that as, as older lawyers, once we've, you know, got a little bit established and have the benefit of that experience, um, it's, um, it's much more valuable from a business standpoint, from a personal standpoint, to take little baby lawyers and help nurture them instead of beat them down. I'm fine with trial by fire. It's totally fine to, you know, to throw them in a case and, and help them along the way and then, you know, be there for them kind of no matter which way it comes out. But um, I, I think there really needs to be um, a kinder um, softer place for young lawyers to land to help them develop and hone those skills because ultimately the work that we're doing is challenging. It's emotional drain, emotionally draining. Um, we struggle with um, civility, dealing with other lawyers. Um, the clients themselves are a bit of a mess. So I think that from a business standpoint, having um, a family-like environment within the firm to help lift up and support um, our, some of our more vulnerable people, whether that's our, our younger associates or whether that's even an older associate who's going through a rough time, that's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that's going to really help us have um, the mental clarity to do a good job, to ask for help when we need it, to avoid malpractice problems, and really to just improve the practice of law as a whole, because it can be, it can be brutal and your coworkers don't need to make it more brutal for you. So it's, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's been a real learning experience. And I wouldn't say, honestly, that that case of mine was a terrible one. But the mindset is what I don't like and, and what I would want to change for another young lawyer coming in. If, if, if I had a new, you know, a younger associate, I would, I would be much more comfortable taking her under my wing than passing her my grunt work, you know, yeah, Help, yeah. helping her see, help, helping train her for skills instead of, you know, beating people down and making, I mean, law, law school does, does that already, right? Like, we're exactly. Good. We're good. Let's lift each other up. Exactly. Uh, so exactly. That's, that's what I would say is yeah. just empower, empower the other women you're working with, because at the end of the day, we're all lawyers, we're all wives and mothers, and we're just doing the best we can to hang on. So, you know, there's just no place, no place for that. And we've got to be supportive. Yes. Agree. Totally. Totally agree. Yeah. Well, Katie, yeah. this has been delightful. It's yeah, been good. wonderful talking to you. I love yeah. all of the great tips and information that you've given to us. And mm -hmm. if, if any of our listeners want to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Yeah, I'm at Hofheimer Family Law, um, and our website URL is Hofflaw, H-O-F-L-A-W.com, and my personal email address is kcarter, that's C-A-R-T-E-R, at Hofflaw, H-O-F-L-A-W.com. So feel free to shoot me an email. I'm, I don't check it at 2 a.m. It's not on my phone, but I do check it pretty regularly during working hours, so I'll be sure to get back to you, and I'm happy to talk to you about any parts of your practice. Wonderful. Well, yeah. Katie, it's been great. Thank you. And oh, you too, Sharon. Thanks for having I hope me. you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.